Funding for the Hinckley Report is made possible in part by the Cleone Peterson Eccles Endowment Fund. Tonight on the Hinckley Report, the nation's eyes turn to Utah's special election as a razor thin margin separates the candidates. Congress works to pass a budget as the federal government teeters on the brink of another shutdown. And our expert panelists weigh in on the major political stories of the summer. Good evening and welcome to the Hinckley Report. I'm Jason Perry, director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Covering the week, we have Boyd Matheson, host of Sunday Edition on KSL TV, Lindsay Ertz, reporter with KSL News Radio, and Daniel Woodruff, reporter with KUTV 2 News. So glad to have you here on the season premiere of the Hinckley Report and just in the nick of time because so much is happening in the political world. So much this summer and so much to talk about today. Glad to have you here with your expertise. Boyd, I want to start with the primary we just had in the state of Utah. It was the, the Republican primary for, a, for the, the race uh, and the seat was vacated by Congressman Stewart. He'll be officially resigning soon, but we had this primary Primary. Let's break this down just a little bit because the results are interesting and instructive, not just now, but what might happen for candidates in the future. As of uh, the airing of the show, about a five point percentage uh, margin separates uh, Celeste Malloy as the winner in this. In fact, concession speeches have already been had uh, and given. So talk about this, particularly through this lens, the urban rural divide that may or may not exist, but it sure looks like it did. It looks like the, the rural vote really uh, showed up and, and showed out in terms of this vote. Vote, and that, I think that really was the difference for Celeste Malloy. Uh, she did the hard work and heavy lifting, uh, spending a lot of time in southern Utah. She has a good base there. Uh, and I think it does show that this district is shifting uh, a little bit. This will be the first time that we have had a representative not from the Wasatch Front. So I think that's a, an interesting thing if Celeste Malloy runs the table into November. And so I think that's an interesting message for rural voters. I also think there was a, a real uh, telling sign in terms of who really engaged with the public. Short race, middle of the summer, yeah vote the day after Labor Day, uh, a lot of complicating factors. Uh, I also think this was a big loss for the consulting class uh, because I think they got it all wrong all the way along. Uh, right, so Lindsay, Lindsay, talk about that for just a moment too, particularly that urban-rural divide because for a very long time, rural Utah has been saying we need someone that represents us. This district has urban and rural counties in it. Uh, this was their moment and it does appear that rural Utah made their voice be known. Yeah, and when you look at whether it's the rural urban divide or redistricting or combination of both or how Celeste Malloy campaigned and how Becky Edwards campaigned, I think all of those things played a factor because the district is now more rural than any other congressional district in the state thanks to redistricting. It only includes uh, two and we'll call it 2.5 with Tooele counties along the Wasatch Front, right? Salt Lake, Davis and Tooele. And then the other 10 counties in the district are considered rural counties counties, although Washington County certainly has urban hubs, right, mm -hmm. in St. George. But Celeste Malloy turned out, like Boyd was saying, in all of the rural and southern Utah uh, counties and it's interesting to kind of piece out was this redistricting was this the turnout because we know that the turnout was higher in Washington and in rural Utah than it was in Salt Lake and Davis counties even by a little bit and so if Salt Lake and Davis counties had turned out more could Becky Edwards have pulled this off meanwhile she needed to do better in southern Utah and rural Utah to bump up those numbers so it's hard to say whether it's just redistricting just the uh, urban rural turnout certainly it's a combination of all of those yeah it does seem to be the case daniel one of the interesting aspects of this uh, based on what boyd was saying a moment too this is a very compressed timeline sometimes when you have a, a, a really short period of time to make your case be known a lot of people default to name id and people in utah had heard the name of becky edwards quite a bit republican circles bruce huff celeste a little less and she leaned uh, hard on very high profile 
endorsements, including Congressman Stewart, who was with her to the very end. Yeah, she had that endorsement, and she really made an effort to get her name out there, particularly in those rural counties. I also want to talk a little bit about the strategy that each candidate had, because throughout this very compressed timeline, you saw Celeste Malloy and Bruce Huff get together for a number of debates, they called them. And uh, one of them was hosted by Boyd uh, with statewide reach. Becky Edwards, in the primary cycle, did not debate. Becky Edwards also did not grant media interviews. Uh, it was really interesting to see almost an incumbent-like strategy of non-engagement with a lot of the traditional campaign-like things, going to do a media interview or getting uh, to take part in a debate. And I, I wonder how much post-mortem she and her campaign staff are having about that in the wake of her loss. I also thought it was interesting being at Celeste Malloy's campaign watch party. When the initial numbers came in, Becky Edwards had a very large lead from those urban counties, but one by one by one by one, that narrowed down. And seeing the mood in that room by those folks, it was down in Cedar City, seeing Southern Utah and rural Utah speaking in a way that ultimately pushed her over the top, it was an interesting place to be at, for sure. I, I, I think the, the thing I was watching all along was, will this very Washington, D.C.-based consulting style uh, that Becky Edwards was clearly deploying, a lot of high-level ads, very yeah. slick, uh, very disconnected. Uh, if that was going to play, didn't show up to any of the debates. Uh, and that's kind of the consulting class saying, look, don't engage on that. You don't have to defend your record, your vote for President Biden. You know, some of those things that I actually have heard Becky give really good answers yeah. to. But I think the fact that they went with this very expensive, very high-level, Celeste Malloy spent about $70,000 compared to 300 plus uh, for the Edwards and, and uh, Huff campaigns. And so I think that was an interesting thing. Thing, but to me, that's the beauty of it, because uh, I was worried that she was going, that Becky Edwards would be able to show you really don't have to engage with voters. You can treat people like flyover counties, like we have flyover states in the country. Uh, and this proved that it did matter, that they showed up, they had great debates in every county, they had great discussions, they were out amongst the people. Uh, and to me, that's good, that's good for the state, uh, that's good for, good for the country to have those kinds of conversations. I wonder if the debate thing, too, is a little bit of pride on the Edwards campaign because when Celeste Malloy came out with this debate schedule, she called it debates and we all called it debates for lack of a better word, right? That's what she called it. Uh, they, The campaign invited all the candidates to be there. Bruce said yes. Uh, Becky said no. Chalked it up to going out to meet with voters, having those long form conversations. And it was a strategy, but at the same time, I wonder if the Becky Edwards campaign was just like, listen, we're not giving Celeste the win on this. We're not going to just participate in what they called campaign events, right? Yeah. And it proved not to be a winning strategy, but I kind of feel like the conversation has turned into, well, she didn't debate, she didn't show up. Yeah. But at the same time, I wonder if that was kind of a little bit of a pride yeah. thing. Yeah, of the, just... the compare and contrast is always so interesting to me. Uh, I remember back in, in 2010, there were 49 debates before the oh, primary yeah. for the Republican Senate seat. And they had them everywhere, the Elks Lodge, the library, any time. I mean, some days there were three debates in a day. But they were having real conversations in that compare and contrast. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I think the Edwards campaign thought, we already have name ID. Let's not let anybody else develop it in the process. Uh, but I think that's a big mistake. I think voters have started to say, you know what? I, I'm going to lean in a little bit more. Uh, I'm going to ask harder questions. And I'm going to listen more. And I'm going to see who shows up. Because I think one of the great disconnects with voters across the country, and especially in Utah, is that disconnect. And they want someone who will show up, uh, who will take the time to have those conversations. And to your point, Lloyd, <clears throat> we're all talking about how Becky didn't debate as opposed to what actually happened at the debates, yeah. right? So yeah. well, not debating yeah. proved to be a thing. Be a thing. Well, yeah. Yeah, Daniel, how did those debates play out in that rural Utah? Because what they saw was a lot of Bruce Huff, a lot of Celeste Malloy. So I'm kind of curious how those two candidates right there kind of played against each other in terms of the votes from rural Utah. Well, I think it ultimately did well for Celeste and I mean I remember talking to her and I said where do you feel your strongest base is and she said from Tooele South and that's where a lot of those events happened and I think it ultimately played out for her and I mean really there was a moment when she was alive with me on uh, election night and it was the moment that Washington County put her over the top and she just did a fist pump <laughs> and and it was interesting because earlier when the numbers were there with Becky with a big lead they weren't discouraged they were still smiling and happy and it was almost like she was saying and I'm just speculating but but 
rural Utah, my strategy came through, mm -hmm. and it's vindicated. It's vindicated. I, I was able to beat the money. I was able to beat the name ID. I was able to beat all of these things that were stacked against me with the support of people from an area that she's familiar with. She was born in Cedar City. She lives there now and knows it well. And Celeste told me the same thing when I talked to her late before Election Day. Um, she just believed that rural Utah could swing this vote. Yeah. She spent a lot of her time there. She focused there. Um, and I was at the Becky Edwards campaign on election night. There was so much excitement in that, yeah, in that initial guys. drop. <laughs> and ironically, they ended the night before the Washington County numbers came in. Now, they said it was because they had to get out of the venue, right? So we'll take them at their word, but there was not that. Washington County came in and it was wah wah. So there wasn't that mood. We left in a yeah. positive light, but there was very much excitement at the beginning when the numbers first came in, almost celebratory, and obviously that didn't play out. Uh, another interesting aspect of this, Boyd, is that uh, we, we have the candidate that came out of the convention, mm. uh, which was Celeste Malloy. Yeah. And so in, in Utah, we've seen you know some of the more conservative candidates come out of the convention and then and more moderate candidates uh, tend to be more successful. That wasn't the case here. How, is, how are you looking at that based on what I think a lot of the conservative Republicans are saying, see the system works? Yeah, and I think it's interesting that uh, as, you, as you look at how that played out, and really between the three candidates, uh, Neither Bruce nor Celeste nor Becky, you could say, is is an extreme candidate. None of them were really talking a whole lot about uh, former President Trump. Bruce Huff did a little in terms of poking at who voted for who, but the vast majority of the conversation was around issues. Uh, and I, so I think. It, the people who go to uh, the caucus and the convention, uh, they want to know the issues. And so I think Celeste did a good job there. But I think Celeste did a great job talking to voters who aren't in the middle of the caucus and convention mm -hmm. system, uh, but who that resonated with say, oh, she actually knows about water. She actually knows about land. She actually understands the legislative process. Uh, and so I think that's why there was probably a little bit more of a balance there. Yeah, do, you, do you feel like uh, people were actually talking about her being the delegate Choice. I mean, I didn't really hear that too much. Yeah, even I didn't, really hear, that I didn't either. really hear that either. And I feel like it's less of a convention versus signature route, as it more so is the makeup of the district and the turnout. Right. Down, down in Washington County, there was that discussion because Bruce Huff put out a mailer that indicated that he was being endorsed by the Republican Party chair, and the Republicans down in Washington County got upset with that and said that's not fair. And the Republican Party chair had to say, "You're right. We're endorsing Celeste Malloy." So I think in some places it played a role, but not certainly everywhere. Okay. Uh, before we leave this in a little bit, uh, just let's talk about turnout. So, Lindsay, you've been working on that, too. Where, where does it look like we're going to uh, be on voter turnout, particularly with the Republicans? I think overall in the district, I think I have these numbers pretty right, but, don't, but just correct me if I'm wrong. I think we're in the high 30s, right? Uh, maybe we've reached 40% yeah, when about, all is said. Right that. about 40. Is okay, it looks right like. about 40, w yeah. Which, interestingly, is exactly what we had in the special election in 2017. Exactly. Right about 40%. And, and we all talked about how different this race is, right? There's really nothing to compare it to. Even in that special election with Jason Chaffetz mm -hmm. uh, back in 2017, we hadn't moved the election dates, right? <laughs> so they didn't move to where there was a, a major holiday, right? in the middle of turning in ballots. Uh -huh. And so um, this election really is an anomaly. Um, but again, I think it goes back to the combination of the turnout, the makeup of the district, and uh -huh. then Celeste campaigning with the, who makes up this district. Uh -huh. uh, one last thing, Daniel, uh, because we're now looking towards November, Kathleen Reby and several others, but she's the Democrat challenger here. Uh, it appears that she's coming out swinging already. In one particular way that stood out to me as I read her statement, congratulating Celeste on her win, as well as, she says, congratulating her on coming back to the district. Uh -huh. So Kathleen Reby is going to try to play up the fact that Celeste Malloy lived back east, that she is not a true uh, Utahn, uh, someone that's lived in this district, she's going to hammer that. That was the part that stood out to me. And it was it was a fiery uh, statement uh, on the heels of this uh, mm -hmm. campaign result. Yeah, I, I think it was really disappointing. I think Senator Reby is way above that. When I, when I read her first tweet, I thought, okay, that's either a staffer or a mm -hmm. campaign consultant who wants to turn this into a classic. You could have put that in any mm -hmm. state in the country, and you had the pejoratives uh, of, you know, far extreme yeah. right wins yeah. again. Uh, it was all the things that we don't want 
in this kind of conversation. So I was disappointed in Senator Reby in going that way. She's wicked smart. She's, she's she can smart. debate. I, I'm looking forward to future debates. Mm -hmm. You talk about a January Walker, a Senator Reby, and a yeah. Celeste Malloy. Those yeah. are three incredibly smart leaders, uh, and that's where the conversation should be. So again, to me, it was one more chalking it up to that's a consultant move, uh -huh. um, and it's disappointing. She's she's better than that, and we need better conversations than that. Yeah, painting someone <laughs> as an extremist is yeah. a tactic, yeah. right? Uh -huh. yeah. And so I. I saw that as well. I'd also just like to point out, you mentioned the three women who will be yeah. on the ballot uh, come January. There are other men on there as well, but just pointing out the fact that Utah will likely have a representative who is a woman. We've yeah. only had, what, five yeah. total mm -hmm. yeah. it, uh, with the next woman that gets elected. Yeah. So it yeah. will be and that will be, those will be, I hope they debate, and I hope they debate often, uh, because those three women are very smart. Mm -hmm. They get the district in a unique way, and, and those would be awesome conversations. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we talked about just a little bit here, uh, and I'm curious how this played out in the debates is uh, former President Trump. Whether or not that factor is in, in kind of impacting Republicans and how they respond. And I, I want to put this through the lens of a poll that the Hinckley Institute of Politics did with the Deseret News. Uh, this was of Utahns in the presidential race that put Donald Trump at 21 percent, Ron DeSantis at 15, and interestingly, another candidate at 23 percent. So, Daniel, uh, those numbers are not very high for the former, former president, even though he's leading that pack. How is his influence kind of reverberating through Utah right now. How are elected officials handling the Trump factor? Well, I think it shows again that Donald Trump continues to struggle to gain broad support in Utah, just as he did back in 2016 when he first ran and Ted Cruz came out. It's interesting to see Ron DeSantis' number maybe not a little bit higher here in Utah, given the support that he's gotten from a lot of the elected officials. We know he visited Utah over the summer here and yeah. has made an effort, and he was here a couple months before that. But I think Donald Trump will always play a role in this. The, the, the matter is, though, he will struggle in Utah with a large number of Republicans to gain the amount of support that we're seeing nationwide. Those numbers you listed are far below how he's polling nationally currently, despite having a number of criminal indictments against him. I also think just Trump continues to be divisive in Utah, and you kind of have this subset of Republicans who either are all in on him or are all out. There's not a lot of, well, I'm still deciding on President Trump. Like, it's either you're yeah, all you know, in or, yeah. yeah, you're all out. If my unscientific Twitter feed is any <laughs> indication of how people feel in Utah about President Trump, then there's a lot of divisiveness. Yeah. Boyd, uh, maybe just give a, a, a small comment on the, the Republican debate we had in DC because we got to, you know, Trump was not there, uh, but other candidates were on full demonstration for voters. Yeah. How did it resonate in Utah? Uh, you know, I, I think the interesting thing, I think a lot of people got a, a really sharp look at Nikki Haley. Uh, she had a very good debate night, was very strong mm -hmm. on her foreign policy, as yeah. was expected. I thought she had a brilliant answer dealing with the abortion issue and saying, let's take it out of this divisive stuff. Let's have an honest conversation, a different conversation about life. Uh, I thought that was a, a good moment for her. She had some good back and forth. But So I think people are starting to see Nikki Haley as, uh, that's someone I could see behind the Resolute mm -hmm. desk in the Oval Office. And so I think she will get a little bump here in the state. I think Tim Scott will start getting some traction in the state of Utah. His message resonates really well here. Uh, and uh, as you look at the others, of course, Mike Pence was here over mm -hmm. the summer yes. uh, as well. And he's actually having a little bit of a, a moment. Uh, and the real test in a presidential campaign is you get these little moments, and then the test is, can you translate that into a movement mm -hmm. and some real momentum going forward? And so that will be the test. Nikki Haley's got to put it together into a package, so she's got a real platform. Mm -hmm. uh, Tim Scott's got to get some more specifics there. Ron DeSantis had all the money and all the momentum going in. Uh, it, it shows you, once again, that uh, cash flow uh, yeah. can cover a multitude of problems inside of a campaign. They spend a boatload of money, and uh, they're still kind of floundering for a message. But on Nikki Haley, too, it's interesting. A recent poll, I believe it was from CNN, CNN yeah. showed her, and correct me, Boyd, if I'm wrong, because you follow this better than <laughs> I do, that she would beat President Biden in a head-to-head, -head, and I believe she was the only Republican of the group yeah. that showed that. And I'm, uh, you know, maybe a debate bump. Uh, or something like that. I think you're right, though. Will she be able to continue the momentum she got from the campaign debate 
going forward into these next few critical yeah, and months. Daniel really hits a, a critical yeah. point here in, in terms of people have to see the viability. Uh, Nikki Haley is really running a general election type campaign, so it's a much more broad appeal. Uh, the test is can you win the primary so you get to yeah. do the general, but ideas that like message, that, yeah. Uh, yeah, on that yeah. message and, and showing that I think is the is the real test. I also think Americans <clears throat> are tired of extremes, and so you saw extremes in the presidential debate with yeah. Vivek Ramaswamy, yeah. if I'm per mispronouncing That's his name, right. forgive yeah. me, I'm not the only one. Um, <laughs> But he's he's much more far right, much more yeah. extreme. So is DeSantis, and perhaps her bump and whether she can coalesce that into a movement was about kind of her more moderate tone, her really digging into policy and having a conversation. Yeah, not perf not performative. The performative yeah. politics is exhausting everybody, mm -hmm. and so I think the fact that the former president wasn't on the stage, Vivek Ramaswamy sort of took that role to get some yeah. of the you know crazy stuff out there. Uh, but I think having a serious conversation about serious issues and policy, getting to the I know radical stuff, policy issues, yeah. is actually starting to resonate with the American people. I think that hurts the former president. National polls, he's still very high. But remember, this is all about Iowa, New Hampshire, yeah. and South Carolina. Uh -huh. One of the issues that came up was about government spending. I think it's important because you talk about things that are performative. Yeah. Are we really talking about another government shutdown at the end of the month? So the, the, the radical thing is that uh, th there are very few duties assigned to the Congress. The budget, funding the government, is one of the very few. Mm -hmm. And they're all coming in. We've heard everyone from Speaker McCarthy and the Republicans to Chuck Schumer, the Democrat leader in the Senate. And somehow they're surprised that September 30th is coming. Yeah. <laughs> and so they'll do what they've done for decades now, both left and right have, and they'll kick it down the road. We'll get a continuing resolution. Uh, and this is how you get 32 trillion in debt. We talk about a continuing resolution saying maintaining spending. Mm -hmm. It's maintaining spending plus. President Biden has already issued the pluses that he wants to add into that continuing resolution, and so we just keep adding. Uh, Congressional Budget Office said we'll, our deficit will be two trillion. It will double this year. Most of that's because of interest. And I love the way, Boyd, you rail on both sides of the aisle on it. <laughs> Equal on this opportunity issue, offender, Right, yeah. <laughs> exactly, where you just say Congress is not doing its job. Yeah. That's that's what you often say. Um, I think when it comes to the government shutdown, we see the direct impacts of this in Utah, right? We see our national parks not be able to be staffed, right? And Utah, the last time this happened, mm -hmm. had to kick in some money to keep them running. It's yeah. a big economic driver in the yeah. state. So we need the government to stay functioning to bring us some money mm -hmm. here in Utah. Yeah, so Daniel, we did see that last time uh, we had a government shutdown in Utah. The direct impacts, our national parks were a big one. The governor had to get involved as well. Uh, is this is sort of a, just a strategy right now for Republicans in Washington, D.C. right now, just try to rein in some of those programs they've been looking at? It seems like each side has a strategy of trying to get what they want by grandstanding for a bit before ultimately coming to a resolution. And certainly sometimes the government does shut down. But all I can say is, as a journalist, here we are again. The story's very <laughs> Very familiar. Uh -huh. I've covered it many times, and I anticipate, you know, like Boyd said, probably by by the end, uh -huh. all said and done, we'll see a, a continuing resolution. But you never know. Yeah. We're sadly, in a strange sadly, world. Sadly, both both sides will raise millions of dollars in campaign cash uh -huh. off of this. They'll rail against the other side, and and we'll have this fake fight. We'll be given a false choice at the end of we either have to vote for all of this, or we're going to shut yeah. the government down. Uh, and nobody wants to do that in an election cycle, so they'll do that at the end. But they're both houses of Congress are completely unserious uh, in what they're doing here. Mm -hmm. And it's up to we, the people, to say, look, if you don't like the job you have, uh, it's not even listed as a power of Congress. Yeah. It's a legislative yeah. duty. It is their duty to fund the government. Uh, we never in the history of ever should there be a government shutdown threat. All Congress has to do is do its job every year. Hmm. It's really simple. And if they don't like doing that, we the people need to give them a chance to go work somewhere else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I want to talk about one more thing uh, that doesn't often come up, but it's the factor now, uh, which is interesting, Lindsay, is uh, this is kind of a story of the summer. Former President Trump, four separate cases, indictments against him. How is that playing out, particularly through this, the kind of the, tr the transition of messaging I've seen, where President Trump is kind of on the campaign trail, raising money, saying, I got indicted for for you, which is a, a different way of approaching. Well, it's not hurt him on the campaign trail. He often raises money after these indictments come out, right? Uh, so it's not hurting him on the campaign trail. I think it will be interesting, though, to see how it plays out in, in getting nominated. In fact, just yesterday I reported on a story about how there's lawsuits making their way across the country yeah. uh, trying to remove Trump from the ballot, citing the 14th Amendment. Now, some are arguing that the 14th Amendment doesn't apply to Trump because he hasn't actually been convicted of a crime, right? And absolutely, he's innocent until 
still uh, proven guilty, as all Americans are. Um, but when you look at these four indictments, it appears to me that two of them are kind of meh, and the two that involve election interference and interfering with the overturning the results of the 2020 election seem very serious to me. And I, I, I wonder how people move past that, because again, you are innocent, um, and we have to wait to see how this plays out, but his trials in these are on March 4th and 6th. Mm -hmm. Super Tuesday is March 5th, right in the middle of those. So it really is going to impact things. Yeah, Daniel, talk about how people are receiving. You're interviewing a lot of people, and they see these indictments. What kind of impact have they had on impressions and likelihood of Republicans or others to vote for him? And, and I'll be honest, Jason, I haven't done a ton of, you know, talking with the regular folks about this, but I think in what I've seen and what I have reported, it's still early. We're still in September, and this we still have months ahead where things could change one way or the other. And so I think, as Lindsay mentioned at a good point, a lot of people have made up their mind about former President Trump. I would say probably most people have made up their mind, as she said, about former President Trump. But we are still only in September, and there is still a lot of time and a lot of room for things to happen for people to look and perhaps change their mind or decide it's not worth it. Maybe we should go with someone that they feel is more electable. Uh, it really, I think, is still to be seen the total true impact of what's happened over the summer mm -hmm. on the race itself. Yeah. Go ahead, I, I think it's really interesting. The, the two resources the campaign has to have to win all the way to November is time and money. So currently, the former president is spending about 40 percent of the money he raises on legal fees. So we know Joe Biden will have about $2 billion to spend. If the f former president was the nominee, he's going to have about half that because he's spending half of his money on legal fees. And then time will be the other. To Lindsey's point, he's going to be dealing with lawyers and lawsuits and courtrooms. And so he's not going to be out there on the campaign trail. So that's an interesting dynamic. I think what will play uh, to Daniel's point in terms of the American people, the more the conversation continues and people just start to say, oh, there is an alternative. There is another choice. Uh, I've been saying that the best thing that President Biden has for his re election right now is Donald Trump. The best thing that is keeping Donald Trump in the race is actually Joe Biden. His health, his age, uh, and his unpopularity actually makes Donald Trump more viable. So in a very interesting twist of irony, uh, those two are keeping each other afloat. The question will be whether the American people see another viable candidate that they can see sitting behind the desk in the Oval. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to close. But we've also seen also here in the state of Utah officials taking a stand on one of these candidates. We'll see how that plays out over time as well. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jason. And thank you for watching The Hinckley Report. This show is also available as a podcast on pbsutah.org slash Hinckley Report or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you next week.